So according to this particular tantric teaching, and the, most of the non-dual tantras are based on this, certainly the Shaivite path, the path of Shaiva, the path of Shakti, and Shakti is Shiva, because Shiva is Shakti. These two most important terms in Tantra represent pure awareness in the guise of Shiva. And the power of that pure awareness to be aware of itself is Shakti. So this is a dyadic relationship, unfathomable, because it's always one and always two. It's two in one and one in two. Two in one and one in two. We can exemplify this in the manner of... <laughs> right. So that's what it means to be tied. A bound, a bound individual, you see? <laughs> we will deal with the term Pashupati later because all spiritual wisdom of India could be traced back to that the period of Pashupati could you raise your hands those of you who are familiar with this term Pashupati yeah Pashu Pati simply means, it's made of two terms, Pashu and Pati. It's the term which stands for someone who is the prisoner, the victim of its own bound essence. Pashu, animal. And Pati, the one that is free. You see? And made into two terms. It's that self-imposition of which we spoke yesterday. We spoke about this fourth and the fifth aspects of your own awareness. The first three are the so-called Hindu trinity, the very well known in Christianity. You can look at them, right? Emission or creation. Right? Sustenance right? or preservation and reabsorption or dissolution, the three. But in addition, Tantra deals with two more. The concealing or the concealment, the aspect, the face of your own awareness, the face of Shiva as concealment, where Shiva, your own awareness, consciously conceals its own essence so as to undergo this embodied experience. And the fifth, Anugraha, the grace revealing, the grace revealing, the grace, the path of self-revelation, or the face of self-revelation. So this is why I thought this kind of good metaphor, you know? It's bound and yet unbound. It's the stand you take, right? It's bound and yet, by its own self-effort, it becomes free. <laughs> So that, <laughs> just to give this, right? <laughs> so that would stand for Shiva, and that would stand for Shakti. You see, One and two. Rabba, any, anyone have a head band? It's one. It's a singularity. One. But you twist it because there is this dynamic tension. There's this dynamic, dynamic quality to that oneness. As it is, on its own, the circle, as in all cultures, represents static quality of absolute, static quality of awareness. 
as it is, it's static. But under its own dynamic self-generating quality, it has the ability inherent within itself to give rise to this, what here stands for this apt metaphor as two in one, one in two. And this is the, the so-called dyadic relationship of Shiva and Shakti. You see? Dyadic relationship of Shiva and Shakti. You see? I'm doing these arrows to show you, to exemplify that relationship. This is the beginning and the end of all Tantras. This understanding is crucial because everything is made of that. Matrix of creation is made of that. Shiva and Shakti is behind the vowels of the alphabet and the consonants. The vowels and the consonants of the alphabet are here represented by the dyadic relationship of awareness and the power to be self-aware of itself. This, this, is where the reconciliation of how that what is absolute and manifest expresses itself as manifestation, congruent and equal in every way. Without that, this is forever remains in oblivion. Without Shakti, Shiva can never behold its own glory. And yet Shakti is Shiva, and Shiva is Shakti. This is an important understanding. So we don't fall into a trap of any mythological interpretation. Shakti as Parvati, beautiful spouse, wife, right? These are for common folk. This is to give entrance, or maybe to conceal tradition, to make it more hermeneutic. So that the passers-by and the uninitiated ones will not have access to it. But the time has come right now when this is looming large. So therefore, these teachings cannot remain in the vaults or libraries. And they are out there. This is the glory of our time, but also the danger of our time. This as an opportunity to bring this teaching and make sure that there is a possibility for having this access to this formidable perspective, view, applicable to your own understanding and then verified through direct experience. So this dyadic relationship exemplified by Shiva Shakti is very important because Shiva is forever remains unperturbed and it is through Shakti spoken of as his own consort is that Shiva can become embodied because that power it is Shiva's power and power is never separate from the source of power. Isn't that obvious? So we cannot speak about Shakti as an inferior aspect of Shiva. Contrary to that, there is this dyadic relationship often graphically exemplified, portraying Shiva as a dead corpse. And what gives rise to all is that what otherwise is a dead corpse, dead because that inertness of the Absolute, when mounted sexually by Shakti. This is how it is depicted in India graphically, to give that analogy of that relationship, <coughs> which later manifested in the hooray of images that made their way all the way to Tibet, known as Tibetan Buddhism, 
with all these so-called embraces, where we see the embrace in that Rudra Yamala-like copulation, simply for the sake of portraying the visceral nature of that relationship. <coughs> because in that amorous embrace, the source and energy are indistinguishable, inseparable. It's one. But what's significant here, in terms of your understanding and reflections, is that in the process of manifestation, Shiva undergoes the process of limiting itself to its own unlimited quality. And it is performed through the power of his own Shakti. So therefore, this experience of individual, this individual experience, is that what we speak of in disguise. This individual experience is nothing other than a transformation that your own awareness, because it is your own awareness, it's not someone's awareness, it's not an outer God and you are the result of. This awareness undergoes this contracted transformation, series of these contracted transformations. And through the series of contracted transformations all the way down to having this visceral experience of here and now, completely, this experience in the body, alive, right? Experiencing joy, pleasure and pain and all the gamut and hooray of sensory perceptions, all the shades of emotional and psychological experiences, all the depth and shallowness of mental intellectual experiences. All this is real, visceral and factual and only possible because awareness undergoes this process via the agency and power of its own self-awareness as Shakti. So it is in the same way, in the same way, that what went into the progressive stages of contraction is being in reverse, undergoes the progressive stages of expansion. And in both cases here, Shakti is the means. Because it is the Shakti that administers this process that we then call the world and this worldly existence, this worldly experience, this embodiment, me and other, me and the world. It's all due to power of Shakti, power of my own awareness. In the same way, that same very power of my own awareness now enacts in the unwinding of that, unwinding of that, what here now was the result of progressive contractions. And through this now, exactly, exactly, stage by stage, series of expanding movements. This process of contraction and process of expansion in tantras spoken of as nimesha and unmesha. The process of contraction and process of expansion. And that also, most importantly, happens at the infinitesimal level of anything and everything. So in other words, there is not just one grand contraction and then grand expansion, but there are infinitesimally minute 
contractions and expansions, contractions and expansions, contractions and expansions. It's known as the pulse of Shiva, Spanda. This pulsating quality of Absolute. It pulsates with the frequency which is unfathomable in terms of comprehending that. And every experience, absolutely every experience, just as I speak right now and you're hearing me right now, is only possible because of that process of continuous expansion and contraction. It's the world comes into being and reabsorbed back into the absolute. Coming into being and reabsorbed. Coming into being and reabsorbed, frame by frame. But of course it's incomprehensible. Certainly we cannot experience it directly because it's so minute, it's so infinitesimal that it seems seamless. But it's not. Even the language is structured in such a way that it reflects that process. For every word, every letter uttered, there is a space. There is this cadence of sound. Otherwise, there will be one muttering, un incomprehensible, something like... No, there is this... Every, everything is made of that. Therefore, the sages were giving analogy of this as a stage. And Shakti comes on on stage to perform the magnificent performance, dance, what have you, for the sake of enjoyment of Shiva. And whenever that act is over, she's off the stage, back merged into the observer. This happens at every, every fraction of the fraction of the millionth fraction of second. Therefore, it is incomprehensible. But this is the pers per perspective with which Tantra of the Shaivites speak of when it comes to this non-created -crea universe, not ever created world. So, going back to identity, going back to this, the conscious act of disidentifying with the temporal cannot bring anything qualitative because we do not know to full measure what are the true building blocks of what went to, into the formation of this individual because that not a dispose, disposable, what is it? Dispo, disposable item. None of you are a disposable item. Everyone instead is a manifestation of pure absolute in the unique form of its manifestation. This is the perspective. So before any disidentification can take place, at least one needs to examine what is actually went into that identification. And the building blocks here are not what is often being called as the cult print. The building blocks are actually those aspects, universal, divine, cosmic aspects, which are at the very base of our individuality. There is no individuality just formed by mama and papa. Nothing to do with just this gene or that gene. Nothing to do even with the environment. All these are superficial surface level of affairs. We can talk about them at that level each to their own. Of course we can talk about that. But if we are to speak about the real picture and the deeper perspective, deeper reality of what and how we are made, that these are archetypal blocks enacting themselves. So this path of identity with the highest, if the highest identity with the utmost is difficult and perhaps requires a certain real leap of 
faith and imagination, then one at least is advised to work with the identity with the highest, therefore identity with these highest archetypal forces. These high, highest archetypal forces represented by specific quality of awareness, aka specific shaktis. So the tradition speaks about this as these divinities, divinities which are at the very basis of your individuality at all its levels. Even a full complex emotional structure of different modes, emotional modes, the so-called rasas in Sanskrit, different emotional states are nothing but expressive potentiality of all these energies. So whatever emotional state we undergo, whether this is remorse, joy, anger, amorous, whatever there is, melancholy, these are divine energies at work. It has nothing to do with, I need to take a pill to feel happy because somehow I feel depressed. It's a very different perspective, very different understanding. I need to have some kind of something, you know, some kind of chemical whatever that can alter. But what if right now this energy is working itself through my being? Therefore, in Tantra, there is a rehabilitation of so-called Otherwise, in the facades of spiritual academies, negative states, negative emotions. Tantra does not speak of any of them as negative. They are all legit. They are all part of archetypes, forms of energy. So... Going back to the metaphysics of the process of emission, metaphysics of creation, and going back to this, how each stage conceals the preceding one, and this is why the, there is no knowledge, why we cannot retain that what went into what is currently being experienced. There's a reason for that. The reason is in the way how consciousness emits out of its own plentitude and expresses itself in its totality, but in stagely manner. There are phases to that process. So the cosmology here, that metaphysical perspective, operates with the terms known in Sanskrit as tattva or tattvas. Please raise your hand, those of you who have heard that term, tattva. Very good. So, for those of you who don't, or who didn't, tattva means simply as that. Tat, that. Tattva, thatness. Thatness of whatever. Water is a certain tattva. Fire as an element, as pure elements, certain tattva. So, this stagely process of absolute in its plentitude and power to express itself in a meeting out of its own svatantria, that power for self-creation, it works through tattvas. And there are 36 tattvas in Kashmir Shaivism, 36 stages, <coughs> 36 aspects all the way from Shiva to the individual. All this is the projection through the tattvas. And each tattva, which evolves out of the preceding one, conceals the tattva that went into the making of the later. Do you see the connection here? You can see this in everything. When you know that, you look around, you observe, and you can see that in the oak tree. From seed to the tree, every stage is concealed. 
and yet there is a tree. So these tattvas, all the way down to the experience, this individual experience, <coughs> is preceded by a mission of these tattvas. And therefore, or likewise, it is reabsorbed through the progressive withdrawal of all the tattvas. So all the tattvas are withdrawn into the subtle ones. You see? Okay, fine. You <coughs> want example. Okay, you know all, this is common knowledge now, the whole tree of life, right? That whole light body, the whole Merkaba, right? Whatever you want to call it, right? Today we'll allow ourselves a bit of Sanskrit, right? You have all these, you have all these chakras. So, at the base, we know there is this chakra associated with the earth element. The finale of that creation in terms of the fullness in the five system of elementary of elements, the great elements, these great Mahabhutas. And then you have the earth, water, right, fire, air, ether. And then it's beyond the elementary order. All these are tattvas. So the reabsorption in the process of awakening, in the process of when life force unleashed, in the process of consummation here, it consumes, consumes from the way of the grosser into the subtler. So the earth is being reabsorbed into water and water reabsorbed into fire and fire reabsorbed into air and so forth. Air reabsorbed into the domain of pure sound, which is the expression of ether. And from there, from the expression of pure sound, is reabsorbed into the subtler category. Subtler category of the Sadashiva, the psychic, pure psychic category. It's no longer physical or even subtle. It's beyond, it's pure psychic. So this process of reabsorption is a mirroring and inverse, inverted process of the process of emission. So, when we go back to the identity, right, this sense of identity, the key question here remains what this identity is. And this is an invitation to revisit and reevaluate that what often is considered to be a wretched state of affairs, of being individual. Because from this point of view, the individual here is deepest mystery. It is a contracted consciousness, awareness coagulated through many, many stages to experience itself, to afford this experience. So, it is for you to reflect on this, whether this is a wretched state of affairs or something else. Or whether there is some more to it. But as far as the experience goes, There is distinctive also phase of being in the presence of divinization of that what we consider to be here, even physical structure. And even outside of this particular tradition that we speak of, we find a lot of analogies, even in the body of work left by Christian mystics where very often against the odds, they explicitly sang the glory of this process of divinization of the body. Because they were going through it directly, first hand. 
This was the experiences, direct cognition, where the whole structure revealed itself for what it is. And we see that in the writings of Teresa of Avila, of the saint of Siena, I forgot her name, the great mystic, Meister Eichhardt, many other saints who run into difficulty with the orthodoxy of the custodians at the time because this sounded as a blasphemy. It sounded completely as a blasphemy because the body from the orthodox perspective is where the fall took place. Body is already a place of sin. This is where the fall took place. So hence the certain even methodologies of lynching oneself was adopted as a spiritual mean where you sit and, and just, you know, sadomasochistically inflict deep wounds on your body. One would just wonder why. Well, because of the profound misunderstanding of what's going on and fear. When we don't understand something, we fear that. And right now, in our day and age, we still live in the age where the body is feared. We don't know what the body is. In a way, just to conclude here before we wrap it up, in a way, just a suggestion that the kind of perspective adopted since the time, and progressively, by the way, of the Industrial Revolution with the allopathic, uh, with the perspectives which are known to all allopathic systems of medicine, seeing the body as that kind of um, Well, something which is far from divine intelligence, but just some kind of uh, an extraordinary, perhaps, yes, way of how it functions and one can dissect and look and this and examine, compartmentalize endlessly. So there was almost a comfort in viewing the body as such because it felt and somehow I'm just I'm not insisting, I'm just suggesting here. This is my own my own kind of reflections on this. Because otherwise it's way too overwhelming to presuppose and to give this possibility. So therefore this perspective, the body is just this some kind of uh, machinery, this you know, something that you can open up, go in and start working on different parts of it, you know, repair endlessly. If you don't like it, you cut it out, you know, suppress it, oppress it endlessly. Because as long as the body is not, never given trust, as long as the body is not viewed as some kind of embedded with its own intelligence, it's too frightening perspective. You say that to a medical authority today, you know, they would think that you need now further assistance from psychiatric department, you know. But we know that there is this greater and greater and greater now evidences that are in the, coming from the field of neuroscience of the extraordinary way of how we can no longer speak of the body as the body. We can no longer speak of the body just as the body. 
it's the field. It's the field of energy. So therefore, there is this, uh, of course, give ri gave rise to this uh, often exaggerated, often uh, removed of remo rem yes, removed from the intricacies, also fields in new age where everything is possible, kind of everything goes because that's another extreme. But there is a lot to that what the body holds here in terms of that field because the body is the field here the field with various different degrees of subtlety so we can never speak about the physical body outside of the subtler domain of the subtle body causal body and so forth So this, these are reflections on sense of identity, what goes into it. And I welcome all of you to reflect on your own. <laughs>